Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Claville, and welcome to this edition of the Claville Report. During this segment, we're going to talk about the Black vote and why it is under attack. From the beginning of this country, we know that voting has been one of the major issues amongst all of our legislatures, states, and special interests. During this time period, Um, Not all persons had the right to vote. We know that only white males who own land and were educated had the opportunity and the right to vote. Later on, all white men were given the right to vote. But there was a fight that ensued for hundreds of years. Again, I, I say that again, a fight that ensued for hundreds of years to give not just blacks the right to vote, but also women. In this segment, we're going to talk about the history of the Black vote, and then we'll take a second look at why it's under attack. Right now, let's take a quick look at this clip from the Undefeated that talks about the history of the Black vote. President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 proclaimed that all persons held as slaves are and henceforward shall be free. But after the assassination of Lincoln in April 1865, most Southern state legislatures enacted restrictive laws known as Black Codes, which denied former enslaved people suffrage and other rights. That same year, Frederick Douglass famously said, slavery is not abolished until the Black man has the ballot. Many Republicans in Congress agreed and passed the 15th Amendment in 1870, which stated that voting rights could not be denied by race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In the decade of Reconstruction that followed, Black Americans elected 22 Black men to Congress and helped to elect Republican Ulysses S. Grant in 1868. But the emancipation of enslaved people and the end of the Civil War spawned the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK used lynching and intimidation to prevent formerly enslaved African Americans from voting. And to make things worse, after Reconstruction ended in 1877, Southern states passed Jim Crow laws to ensure segregation of African Americans by race. As a result, black voting rights were suppressed through poll taxes, literacy tests, and the grandfather clause that still allowed illiterate white men to vote if their grandfathers had voted by 1867. So as Jim Crow was restricting the rights of black Americans in the South, women of all races were fighting for their right to vote. The fight for women's suffrage was rooted in the anti-slavery movement with leaders such as Sojourner Truth, a preacher from Ulster County, New York. She had been freed in 1827 and became an outspoken proponent for women's rights and suffrage. But early white suffragist leaders who were outraged that the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote before white women broke off their association with abolitionists. Check this out. In 1918, in a letter lobbying for the 19th Amendment that would give women the right to vote, white suffragist Carrie Chapman Catt wrote to Southern congressmen stating, the present condition of the South makes sovereigns of some Negro men, while all white women are their subjects. These are sad but solemn truths. If you want white supremacy, why not have it constitutionally, honorably, The Federal Amendment offers the way. So then after the 19th Amendment was ratified in August 1920, Black women were still not granted full voting rights, as the amendment didn't address the state laws and intimidation meant to deter Black Americans from voting. Fast forward, during the 1932 presidential election between incumbent Republican President Herbert Hoover and Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt, African-American sentiment toward the Republican Party began to change. You see, Hoover's administration failed to apply economic relief for Black Americans hit hard by the Great Depression. He also tried to attract support from the Southern segregationists, who were responsible for upholding oppressive policies against African-Americans. According to Vincent Hutchings, a diversity professor at the University of Michigan, Data showed that about two-thirds of African Americans were identified with the Democratic Party by 1960. A succession of events during the Black struggle for civil rights in the following decade would strengthen African American support for the Democratic Party. First, during the Freedom Summer Campaign in 1964, in which college students traveled to Mississippi to help Black citizens register to vote, 
Organizers Michael Schwerner, James Cheney, and Andrew Goodman were kidnapped and killed on June 21st. Two weeks after that, on July 2nd, President Lyndon B. Johnson, a Democrat, signed the Civil Rights Act into law, banning segregation in America. This led Republican nominee Senator Barry Goldwater to staunchly oppose the Civil Rights Act during the 1964 presidential race against Johnson, further alienating Black voters from the Republican Party. Johnson went on to win the election. Finally, in 1965, Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law that banned literacy tests and other methods used to suppress the Black vote. The percentage of eligible Black voters in America went from 23% before the Voting Rights Act to 61% by 1969. From 1992 to 2006, the number of Black Americans in Congress were in the high 30s and low 40s. In 2012, 66.6% of eligible Black voters turned out at the polls to re-elect the United States' first African-American president, Barack Obama. This was the first time that Black voters outnumbered white voters for a presidential election. But African-American voters still face voter suppression through political exercises such as gerrymandering, a way that state legislatures are redrawing maps to diminish the Black vote. Other practices that continue to suppress the African-American vote include purges of voter rolls in Black communities, arduous voter ID laws, changes to voter registration requirements, limitations of polling locations in Black communities, and reduced early voting options. But despite all this, it is pivotal that Black Americans hit the polls because the best way to end oppression is to vote. As you can see, the fight for voting rights in America, especially for white America, for Black Americans, has been a struggle since the beginning of time. Just even looking at some of those pictures and listening to a lot of the history behind what it took to get us the opportunity to vote, it gives me so much pride to know that we come from a people that continues to fight and overcome. But it also gives me a, gives me pause and sadness to know that it took that much just to provide the right to vote for a group of people that helped to build this country, a group of people that are so intricately entwined with the United States of America. I've said it before, and I've said it on this segment, I've said it in many speaking engagements that I do that there's nothing more American than being African-American. African-Americans are the definition of what American should be. By giving our lives, our hard work, our blood, sweat, tears, innovation, ingenuity, and forgiveness, and our work toward helping not just African-Americans, but all people to achieve equity and inclusion across the spectrum. You know, we saw that when, after the Civil War, when the 20 some odd African Americans were elected to Congress, passed laws, not just to help African Americans, but you, you look really deeply into that and we'll do a segment about it. They passed laws to help all Americans. That is the spirit of being African American. That's part of the fabric of who we are in this country. That's part of what helps to make and continue to make this country great in what it is. But we can't make true change in policy without the right to vote. You just simply can't do it. And that right to vote is something that's been fought for, something that we've bled for, something that we've died for. You know, I, I, I saw the the pictures that were drawn that depicts the time period where Jim Crow reared his ugly head and suppressed the gains made by African-Americans after the Civil War. You know, segregation in the time of Jim Crow was a very terrible time because you were free, but at any moment, your rights can be trampled upon. So were you really free? It was, a, it was constantly being questioned over and over again. 
more specifically as it relates to voting rights. You know, states, even though the federal government provided the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to abolish slavery, to make African Americans uh, or black citizens at that time, citizens, which then became African Americans, and to give the right to vote, again, to black men, not black women. Of course, there was a discussion about the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, as it's called, where women, all women, were given the right to vote. However, when I say given the right to vote, the it was fought for the right. And the 19th Amendment effectuated the right to vote for all women. Because nothing during that time was given. It was all earned. I want to make sure that we understand that. But what fell during that time period of the fight for the 19th Amendment is that Black women, the issues of oppressive and suppressive laws against them, just like Black men, was not spoken to. So therefore, Black women, just like Black men, continue to have this fight of trying to vote with the with the foot on the on the head of the serpent of discrimination not being removed. So they had problems voting because these laws were continually oppressing and suppressing their rights until that foot was removed by the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But we'll get to that in just a moment. So now we have this opportunity in America. We are formerly enslaved people are given the opportunity and the right to vote. But because of the oppressive and discriminatory laws in various states, under Jim Crow segregation, various provisions were implemented to stop, halt, and suppress that right to vote. Grandfather clauses. If your grandfather didn't vote, then you can't vote. Of course their grandfather couldn't vote. They were slaves. I mean, that's that, that's common sense, right? But that's the reason why the law was enacted. Again, we're looking at the history. I believe that there's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon says. And I say what was, is, and what is shall be. In other words, various laws and policies that were created for one reason hundreds of years ago are being created today for the same reason, to suppress and stop African Americans from voting. Why? Because voting it's the most powerful nonviolent weapon we have in our democracy. Voting puts legislators and people in office to pass bills that will and statutes that will help you in society. They will it gives us the opportunity to remove suppressive laws that keep us from gaining an equitable opportunity. Again, equitable opportunity. We've talked about equality a lot, but it's really about equity, equitable and an opportunity to achieve what we've deemed to be the American dream, or just to progress. The ability to utilize your abilities to achieve greatness. That's what <laughs> free will, and that, that's what we're, we were given in, on this earth, God-given rights. And no one should be able to take that away from us, not even our fellow man and fellow citizens. So you have these oppressive voting law uh, regulations called grandfather clauses. Literacy tests. If you can't read, then you can't vote. Now, keep in mind, these were only applied to Blacks, African-Americans that were voting, not white citizens. So they were discriminatory in its, in its, not just in its effect, but also in its intent. The intent was to stop them from voting in its effect was also to stop them from voting by applying it only to Blacks. So now we see grandfather clauses, literacy tests, also poll taxes. In order to vote, you got to pay a tax. Well, <laughs> we know that during that time period, not many people had extra money. Most people survived on sharecropping. Most people survived on farming on their own land. We were still an agricultural driven society. Most people were not wealthy. They simply were not. You were lucky to have one good pair of shoes. One good pair of trousers or slacks, one one good shirt, right? You were lucky to have something to eat every night. You were lucky to have that. So how in the world are you going to pay a tax to vote once a year, maybe once every four years? It just simply didn't happen. But again, in its intent and in its effect. And then we had other egregious and ridiculous laws, such as 
you know, guess how many jelly beans in a jelly jar, how many bubbles in a bar of soap and, and the like. Absolutely ridiculous. When we take a look at the history of America, the full history of America, we leave out the ugliness. But when we look at history, history is simply his story. It's a story of mankind. It's a story of our actions toward each other in every single sphere or aspect of our lives. And that story needs to be told to understand where we came from, where we are, but more importantly, where we want to be and what we can be. That's the issue. That's why teaching history and understanding history in its entirety, it's so very important. But as we fast forward, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed which gave enforcement by the attorney general the right uh, for African-Americans to vote without their rights being abridged by these frivolous laws, policies, and regulations made in various states. So when that happened, African-Americans started to vote in record numbers. And it continued to vote in rise in record numbers until we got to 2008-2009, where African-Americans outvoted by number, by the sheer number of white voters, not by that much, but by sheer numbers to elect the first black president of the United States. And we reelected him as well. Now, that is definitely something that we can look at and say, that's the reason why we voted, we fought, we bled, we died. That's the reason why we continue to push and push and push for this change. I remember those eight years. I believe if you, even the policies that were passed, his first policy, President Obama's first policy, <laughs> many people said he was going to do everything for the black people. But his very first policy was to help all people by giving all persons in the United States access to health insurance. Think about that. There's nothing more American than being African-American because the policies and our actions are not just to progress our interests, our race, our people, but to progress all people in our great nation. How phenomenal is that? I always say, check the record, not the rhetoric. Check the record before you believe the rhetoric because if you do so, You'll find yourself saving a lot of time and making fewer mistakes because the record speaks much more truth than the rhetoric. So now we have the Voting Rights Act. We have the protection of preclearance within the Voting Rights Act. And we see the work and the legacy of all those that died for our right to vote. But then you have a Republican legislature that gets into office after Barack Obama is elected and he started acting these restrictive voting laws across the country in various states. One in particular is Shelby County versus Shelby County, Alabama. And they bring a lawsuit against the preclearance part of the Voting Rights Act, which has to be renewed every so often. And they challenge this provision, and they challenge it for one reason. But before we get to the result of Shelby County versus Holder in the U.S. Supreme Court and its impact of voting rights, let's take this quick moment to take a look at this second clip from Quimby, which talks about the journey of Shelby County versus Holder case and how it got to the U.S. Supreme Court. Here. Racial discrimination, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The act put certain states on probation for their historical disenfranchisement of African-American voters. In the 2013 case of Shelby County versus Holder, the United States Supreme Court addressed whether these probations are constitutional. Before Congress's enactment of the act, several states employed a number of tests required for citizens to pass in order to register to vote. In many states, this resulted in white citizens registering to vote 
at a rate of approximately 50% higher than African-American citizens. Congress, fed up with pervasive racial discrimination in voting, enacted the act. Section 2 of the act applies nationwide and bans any standard, practice, or procedure that limits a citizen's right to vote on account of race or color. For states that previously maintained the most severe voting restrictions, Congress also enacted Section 4 and Section 5. Section 4, known as the coverage formula, determines which states would be subject to Section 5. Section 5 prohibits changes in state voting procedures without federal approval. The states originally subject to Section 5 were Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia. The coverage formula and Section 5 were set to expire in 1970, but Congress reauthorized the act several times, most recently in 2006. At that time, new statistics demonstrated that voter registration was nearly equal between white citizens and African Americans in the states covered by the act, with African American voter turnout exceeding white voter turnout in most of the states identified by the coverage formula. Armed with this data, Shelby County, located in the covered state of Alabama, sued the United States. Shelby County alleged that Section 4 and 5 were facially unconstitutional and asked for a permanent injunction against their enforcement. The district court disagreed with Shelby County, finding that the evidence before Congress in 2006 was sufficient to justify reauthorizing Section 4 and 5. The United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit affirmed, So we see that the moment that opposition to ensuring fairness and equitable treatment of all persons as it relates to voting acts reached a certain level, the attack comes. And the attack is within the courts. I want you to join us for another clip of report when we talk about the importance of the judiciary and its impact upon all of our laws, including voting voting laws. What we see in Shelby County versus Holder, that pre-clearance aspect of the Voting Rights Act was challenged. Now, you've heard, you know, probably heard in the past where we talked about, oh, the Voting Rights Act is under attack and we, we have to save it. Well, not the entire Voting Rights Act from 1965, but this very, but this, this provision, of the Voting Rights Act itself, which is known as preclearance. Basically, there are states that historically discriminated against African Americans with the right to vote. And we talked about that earlier when we took a look at Jim Crow era uh, voting restrictions. Well, before you could change voting uh, processes, voting laws, regulations, or even redraw your maps based upon the U.S. Census, data every 10 years. It has to be pre-cleared by a division of the United States Department of Justice Office, Civil Rights Division, which then looks at it, takes into consideration the discriminatory effect of past laws and its current discriminatory effect of the proposed provisions and changes, and then renders a decision. Either they will uphold it to say it's fine by a decision, or they will send it back and say, no, this violates, redo it. Now, with this provision being struck down, it cleared the way itself for states with a history of discrimination to craft new voting laws without federal oversight. Again, without federal oversight. Let's take a look at one case in particular. In North Carolina, the moment, it seems like the moment after this, this, this case itself was, was actually challenged. And of course, again, after the challenge or this, pre, this provision was challenged and the case was upheld, states started enacting discriminatory laws immediately. Many elect, enacted ID laws and regulations in order to, for an opportunity to vote. Others when as far as defining who can vote and others when as far as eliminating polling places, shortening the time that you can vote and the like. Now, why is this important? Well, the Constitution gives states the opportunity to, uh, the power in order to execute 
voting procedures in their states. Now, execute the procedures in their states, but it has, but those procedures cannot go against the Constitution or federal law. With Shelby, or with Shelby versus Holder, that decision in their hand. Now these changes can be made without oversight of the federal government. And the only challenge is, or would be itself, a judicial or legal challenge. Now, let's take a look at what happened in North Carolina. In North Carolina, this particular voter law was crafted. It, it, the fight began in 2013. And this is, I'm quoting from an NPR uh, article. It said that, and this is from Michael Thompson, a member of station WFA. He wrote, he said, about the lengthy battle over North Carolina's laws, which was meant to compact voter fraud. But he said that fight began in 2013 when the state made cuts to early voting, created a voter ID requirement, and eliminated same-day registration, out-of-precinct voting, and pre-registration of high school students. More than half of all voters using early voting, listen to this, more than half of all voters using early voting. And African Americans do so at a higher rate than whites. African Americans also tend to overly vote for Democrats, overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. More than half of all voters use early voting. I use early voting as much as I can. It's great. You go in and vote whenever you want. When the time provision opens up, you can avoid the lines, and if you want to participate in the democratic process of campaigning or being a poll watcher or whatever the case may be, you have that opportunity because your day is freed up. But African Americans have said do so at a higher rate. Now, these laws and these provisions of the law were actually struck down in July 2016 by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal. Now, within this, the court said. This is the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal, the Federal Appeals Court, which encompasses five states, including North Carolina. There's no other court higher than the U.S. Supreme Court. In its ruling, the appeals court made this statement. It said the law was intentionally designed to discriminate against black people. Let me, let me read that again. The law was intentionally designed to discriminate against black people. I'll read that one more time. In its ruling, the appeals court said the law was intentionally designed to discriminate against black people. North Carolina legislatures had requested data on voting patterns by race, and with that data in hand, drafted a law that would, quote, this is from the court decision, target African Americans with almost surgical precision, the court said. I'll say that two more times. North Carolina legislators had requested data on voting patterns by race. And with that data in hand, drafted law, a law that would, quote, target African-Americans with almost surgical precision, unquote, the court said. Quote, they would target African-Americans with almost surgical precision, unquote, the court said. And of course, after this defeat, the state appealed this, the state and then Governor Pat McCrory appealed McCrory this decision for the Fourth Circuit, and the Supreme Court discussed whether to hear the case under a new Democratic governor. Uh, asked to withdraw the appeal, but the appeal from the High Court would not would, would not be heard. So the court itself, the U.S. Supreme Court, refused to hear the case, and it refused to reinstate the law in time for the elections. So that's the power of the U.S. Supreme Court. It also puts a check on these very bad appeals. That case within itself speaks volumes. It gets it, 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 it gets no clearer than that. And we're talking no more than several years ago. This wasn't this wasn't during the 60s, it wasn't during the 50s, during the time of the, after the Civil War. We're talking several years ago. This is we're in 2021 now. This was 2017, right? And this took place. That is the power 
that others look at our right to vote and say we have to stop. This is, you need no more information than this to understand how powerful the right to vote is. Now, let's look at some updated data. When we take a look at the impact on our voting rights, this is from the Brennan Center for Justice. The Brennan Center for Justice, uh, their uh, segment on voting laws roundup of, up till May 2021. So we're talking, this study was done less than three weeks from the time we're doing this segment. States had already enacted. They they looked at how, how many states and how many laws states had enacted to make voting harder for mostly African-Americans and other people of color. States have already enacted more than 20 laws this year, in 2021, that will make it harder for Americans to vote. And many legislatures are still in session. You know, I, I, I laugh out of, I have to laugh because it's not only is it funny, it's so blatant, but I have to do that because if not, I, I would be angry. States of our acting more than 20 laws this year in 2021 and made it harder for Amer Americans to vote. To restrict the vote continues. Between January 1 and May 14, 2021. All right, January 1, 2021, May 14, 2021. I know in the Commonwealth of Virginia, our legislature begins January 1st. At least 14 states have enacted 22 new laws that restrict access to the vote. Rural track to far exceed the most recent period of voter suppression in 2011. Because by that year, in 2011, October, 19 restrictive laws were enacted in 14 states. This year, the country has already reached that level, and it's just May. In addition to that, according to this Brenner Center for Justice Research, more restrictions of vote are likely to become law. One third of legislatures are still in session. And at least 61 bills with restrictive provisions are moving through 18 state legislatures. More specifically, it states in this study that 13 have passed at least one chamber while another 30 have some committee action that they go through, hearing, amendment, and the like committee vote. But overall, lawmakers have introduced at least 389, 389 restrictive bills in 48 states. Think about that. 389 restrictive bills in the United States. 389. 389. I want that to sink in just for a moment. Three hundred eighty-nine so far in forty-eight states in twenty eleven legislative sessions. Three hundred eighty-nine restricted bills in forty-eight states in twenty twenty-one legislative sessions. When we put that in context, we're looking at this time period being a moment where we have to continue to fight for our right to vote, fight for the fairness of our democracy, fight and honor the legacy of all people, African-Americans that died, allies that died, for there's right to vote. We can't stop. We won't stop. We will not stop until we continue to give equity across the board to all people with the right to vote. Because when we have the free and fair elections and the right to vote become unabridged, our democracy is better, our democracy is stronger, and our world is better for it. Thank you so much for joining us for this segment of the Clavier Report, where we discuss the Black vote and why it's under attack. Make sure you go to our social media and subscribe, our Facebook page, like, share, and follow us. And let us know, give us your comments and let us know how we're doing. Until next time, this is Dr. Eric Clavier, and thank you for joining us for this segment of the Clavier Report. See you next time.